Okay, good. Let's get let's get started here. So, did anyone anyone go to the volleyball match last night? No one. Good. Where'd you sit? Oh, uh, just in front. I was. Okay. Inside the field. So you were on the on the floor. The floor, yes. So, could you see it well? I mean, were you having to look up like this? Uh, well, because of my height. So I was <laughs> I had some people that were just looking at the screen. They were in front, but they couldn't see anything. They were just yeah. missing the screen. Yeah, I was wondering if some, yeah. some of those people would just look at the screen only. Yes. Yeah. So, so was it really as cool of an atmosphere as it appeared on TV? Oh, yes. <laughs> you actually get to see whatever that is happening and yeah, the energy too. So. Good. I, I know when I was watching last night, I was like, why didn't I get tickets? <laughs> you know, that, that would have been cool to go to. Um, so, the, you know, they had that drone show, drone show at the end. Was it, in, in the way the camera angle was on TV, they were just showing it over, I think it would have been the northeast side of the stadium. Was that the only place where they had the drones or was it any other place? Oh, oh yes. Uh, it brought us that place. Yeah. Okay. It's like, it's like a link. Uh, you get a specific, specific location where we all have to turn, even if you're okay. towards that side, you still have to turn your back and you know. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Well, good. That was, did anybody else watch it on TV or? Yeah. That, that, that was an interesting, interesting event, definitely. And hopefully they do it again. Um, okay. So uh, that week number two quiz, just to make sure you understand how we do things in this class. Uh, uh, like last night, uh, you would have uh, seen uh, the grades posted. Also, the answers were available, so you can see um, in case you missed the problem. Overall, the grades tended to be very, very good on that quiz. Uh, the purpose is just to you know, make sure that you're continuing to follow along on, this, on these topics. Uh, it's not meant to be a comprehensive quiz over all the material, in this case, the introduction to R stuff. Um, so just realize that there might be, like on a test, there might be questions that are a little bit different than what you would see on that quiz. Are there any questions uh, before we get going here today? Okay, so today we're going to finish up matrix algebra. We just have basically one uh, small thing here to do, uh, and then we're going to start another subsection of the notes called data distributions and correlation. Okay, so we're gonna talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I remember the first time when I was an undergraduate, I saw eigenvalues and eigenvectors in a full semester long matrix algebra class. And I thought, these things are really weird. <laughs> you know, who, who would ever thought of doing, as you will see here shortly, doing these kinds of calculations? And it's interesting the number of places, though, in the end that eigenvalues and eigenvectors actually pop up in terms of a variety of different disciplines. So what I want you to get out of this is know the basic definition of what an eigenvalue and an eigenvector is. Uh, understand some, some properties of these um, items. And also how to do the calculations in R. As we go along in the semester, you'll see these eigenvalues and eigenvectors pop up. And when they do, you'll say, oh, okay, I, I know why they are important. Okay, so we can only calculate these quantities uh, based upon a square matrix. So let's say that we have a square matrix. It's, let's say, P by P in dimensions. We're going to call it A. And simply what an eigen, I should say simply, but what an eigenvalue is is as follows. Suppose we have this matrix A again. We subtract off from it the identity matrix, but we're going to multiply this identity matrix by a scalar value, a, a constant. We're going to call it lambda for the lack of a better letter, let's say. So we're going to take A minus lambda times I, and then we're going to find the determinant of that. We're going to set this whole thing equal to zero, solve for lambda. The lambda that we get in the end is what's called an eigenvalue. And so what happens, and I think it's easiest to see this in a, if we had simply a two by two matrix. So P is equal to two. What happens in the end, if you go through all the calculations, you get basically a polynomial, and then you can go back to your algebra days, 
is to say, how can I find the root of this polynomial? In this case, there's going to be two roots, or two different possible values of lambda that end up leading this to be zero. So in the end, if we were to do this by hand, we could use the old quadratic formula and come up with what the possible values of lambda would be for this two by two case. Um, when we have, let's say, a more general, a three by three, four by four, let's say p by p, then we're going to have a larger polynomial that we're going to have to solve. And we wouldn't want to do that by hand. Let's just let R do that for us. Now, if A ends up being a symmetric matrix, uh, and just to review again what a symmetric matrix is, that means, for example, this value here is equal to this value here. This value here is equal to this value there. So if you interchange the rows and the columns, you get exactly the same matrix back. If you have a symmetric matrix, then these eigenvalues are actually real numbers. Okay, well, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, depending upon what you've done in your algebra class, a, um, it, when you use the quadratic formula, you might run into a problem where this quantity here is less than zero. And so, again, depending upon what you've done in algebra class uh, in the past, you know that, let's say, for example, if I have negative one there, we call that an imaginary number, often referred to as i. We won't have to worry about those kinds of numbers here. Uh, but that's what could happen. But as long as the matrix is symmetric, we don't have to worry about having imaginary numbers. Everything's going to be real, like a regular old number. You can order these corresponding, let's say, possible values of lambda uh, from largest to smallest, where lambda 1 is the largest, lambda p is the smallest. So how can we do this in R? Uh, well, fortunately, there's a, a, a simple function R called I. So I create my matrix. Just to review, the matrix uh, function, uh, the argument is data, where I put the data in there, or the, the, uh, the values of the matrix. I combine these values together into uh, a, what's actually a vector to begin with, using the C function. I state the number of rows, the number of columns, and then I say by row equal true, so that 1 and 0.5 is the first row, and then 0.5 and 1.25 is the second row. Put that into A, and if I say eigen uh, of A back, this is what I get. Um, and what's actually returned in R's terminology is what's called a list. And you saw that in the introduction to our uh, material when we actually estimated a regression model using the LM function. And so if I say, for the lack of a better name, say.it is equal to eigen parentheses A in parentheses. If I say names save.it, what will come back are the components of the list, values, and as you will see shortly, there's something called eigenvectors. And so if I say save dot it dollar sign values, I have two eigenvalues that come back. Again, I had a two by two matrix, that's why I have two eigenvalues. So 1.64 and 0 0.6096. Okay. So we have these things called eigenvectors. Every eigenvalue has an associated eigenvector with it. And all that an eigenvector, I should say, is, is as follows. So you take your original A matrix. The eigenvector, I'm going to do it symbolically by B. So if I take A times B, that's going to be equal to my eigenvalue times B again. Vectors that satisfy this, values of B that satisfy this, are called an eigenvector. These eigenvectors are not unique, though. Um, <coughs> most of the time, software packages will give these eigenvectors to have a length of 1. Well, what do I mean by a length of 1? Well, if you were to, as you will see shortly, as I have here two pages ahead, if you were to actually graph the vector, if you don't know how to graph the vector, we'll, we'll look at it quickly. If you actually graph the vector, 
uh, basically the length of it is one. That's the way that software packages often present it, and that's the default for, for R. And so where they don't, where, where they are not unique is that you could actually, let's say, multiply that eigenvector by two or by three, and that changes the length of the vector. How do you actually calculate the length of a vector? Well, let's say we have simply a two by, I'm sorry, a two by one vector. Uh, it has elements of B1 and B2. All you need to do is you square each of the elements, add them, and take the square root. That will be the length. Uh, if that's not clear, if you haven't seen that before, don't worry. I'll have a nice graphical demonstration of that shortly. Now, one of the properties of eigenvector that's kind of interesting is that uh, you know, imagine a particular case where I have just a, a two by two matrix A, and if I were to take the transpose of my first eigenvector corresponding to that first eigenvalue, that largest one, so I have B1 transpose, if I were to take that times B2, I get zero in terms of a two by one vector that just has zeros in it. You'll see how that comes about in a graphical sense uh, shortly. So whenever that happens, whenever you have vectors where that happens, um, we say that these vectors are orthogonal to one another. Interestingly, if I were to take the trace of this matrix A, that is, ends up being the sum of my eigenvalues. Also, if I were to take the determinant of A, that ends up being the product of all my eigenvalues. Just in case you haven't seen this symbol before here, this uppercase pi character represents taking a product, where the, all of you have seen the summation symbol before, that's the Greek letter, uh, uppercase letter sigma. And so what this, um, this product symbol basically means is if I were to take, um, if I have lambda i there, as you can see, Take the product from i equal 1 to p of lambda i, that just means lambda 1 times lambda 2 times lambda 3, and so on. That's all that is. Okay. So let's talk about then the eigenvectors of this uh, small example uh, involving the matrix A. So for my two eigenvalues, I can come up with eigenvectors corresponding to them. And two possible vectors as follows. For that first eigenvalue, I can have this is my eigenvector, which has a length of 1. So if I were to take 0.61 squared plus 0.78 squared, the square root of it, I would get 1. For lambda 2, I could go ahead and get this is my eigenvector. Now, Again, how are we going to do the calculation for us here? Well, we're simply going to rely on R to do this. And you can see here are my eigenvectors in the dollar sign vectors component of um, the results from the eigen um, uh, operation. So I could pull out the eigenvectors like this. I could look at just, let's say, the first eigenvector. Oops. Look at just the first eigenvector. Uh, by looking at just the first column of that resulting matrix that was returned to me that had those eigenvectors in it. To do the second one, I put a 2 there instead. Okay. Now, let's do a plot. Let's actually look at the plot first before we look at uh, how we actually do the plot in R. So this is how you can plot a vector. Um, I, I think I think when I was in school, maybe the, at least the first time, or I know I saw it like when I took my third semester of calculus in terms of how to graph vectors, you might see this in, in an algebra class as well. But if you haven't, here's a really brief introduction. So this first eigenvector, let's see, what was the values again? Um, 0.62 and 0.79. Okay. So to graph this vector, the way that people do it is they start at the origin of a plot. So the 0, 0 coordinate of a plot. 
And notice how on the x-axis I have possible values of B1, which would be the one, one element of that vector. I also on my y-axis have possible values of B2, which is the 2, 1 um, element of that vector. And so all I do is I you know, find 0.62 here, find 0.79 here, draw a little point there. And the way that vectors are often drawn is I do an arrow. And the reason being is because, well, I'll, say, I'll tell you why in a second here. And so if you wanted to, you could actually figure out how to find the length of this vector by using the old, um, uh, pi oh, I can't, can't remember, the Pythagorean theorem uh, that you learned about in, in algebra class, where notice here, if I were to draw this right triangle, it has a length of 0.62 here, a length of 0.79 here. So if I take 0.62 squared plus 0.79 squared, and then square root of it, I get that part, that length of that part of that triangle. Okay. Um, so why do we have an arrow there? Well, if I were to change the length by just multiplying, let's say, each of these elements by two, well, now this is just going to extend this vector out a little bit further from the origin. And so that's why you typically see people um, write this with an arrow. Now, I could also graph the other uh, eigenvector as well. And notice if you compare the two here, notice that they basically form a right angle, an angle 90 degrees right there. Okay? Um, and so, uh, you know, in an algebra class or geometry class, you will learn that we would say these are perpendicular to one another. And so you can think of orthogonal, uh, orthogonality basically being the same concept of perpendicular, but orthogonality extends to many more dim dimensions in terms of if we had a three by one vector, or four by one vector, or five by one vector, you still have the product of those vectors equal, uh, equal, equaling zero. Okay, so how did I do this plot then? This is a little bit more of a complicated plot to do at this early semester, but I think, I think it's okay. Um, so to begin with here, I'm going to do one little thing here. I'm going to use the PAR function. PAR stands for graphics parameters. It allows me to control some general overall ways that my plot's going to look. And PTY corresponds to plot type. And if I give it the argument of S, it means square. Why did I do that? I notice how this plot looks like, you know, has the same length for the x-axis, same length as the y-axis. I just did this to make it look pretty because we are actually concerned in this case, understanding the length of vectors and stuff like that. So that's why I made sure everything was on exactly the same um, uh, 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 um, Ah, I can't think of the right word. Everything at the same length for x and y axis. <laughs> um, now the default, whenever you do a plot, and I will be doing a lot of plots uh, in a few, uh, a few classes, the default is M, meaning maximal, meaning draw that plot over the maximal to maximize the plot over the size of your window where you're plotting, uh, doing the plot from. That's the default. Okay, now to do this plot, I'm going to set up some dummy values, you could say, for, for the plot, where I want to set up some stuff so I can control what the plot's going to look like before I actually even um, uh, plot the vectors themselves. So I'm going to create simply an object called B1, for the lack of a better term, but I guess I, it makes sense because this is going to be corresponding to my x-axis. It's going to be negative 1 to 1, B2 is going to be negative 1 to 1, and then I'm going to plot on my x-axis B1, plot B2 on my y-axis, or the corresponding values on my, on my y-axis. And let me just show you what happens when I do that, and that will help me explain the arguments. So notice I get this as my plot. By putting type equal n there, that says no. Don't actually plot points for corresponding to B1 and B2. And so what this does, it allows me to open up basically a, um, a blank plot. 
to some respect in terms of I still have the axes there, but I haven't plotted anything yet. I do some more fancier things than probably what we need to do right now. I can use what's called an expression function to put some mathematical more characters on there. So for example, to get um, subscripts, I say expression B bracket one and bracket. And what that does, it allows me to do a B subscript one for the X axis label. Don't worry about that. Um, if you want to get fancy, you can, but if you don't want to, that's completely fine. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a horizontal line at zero. It has a line type of solid and a line width of two times the default. And the way I can do that is with the AB line function. Normally, what the AB line function allows you to do is simply plot, let's say, y is equal to a plus b times x, that you would that kind of a line that you would learn about in an algebra class. But there is a special argument that you can use called H for a horizontal line. So I'll go ahead and do that. Let's see the results. And now I have that. I'm going to also do a vertical line at zero. And the only reason why I'm putting these lines there is just to help us see uh, where zero is located, since we're drawing arrows, essentially, out from the origin. To do the arrows then, then I use an arrows function. I'm going to start at zero for my x and y axes. And so x zero says, what's the x coordinate that you start at? Y zero says, well, what's the y coordinate that you start at? And I want to draw an arrow out to what the value of b1 and b2 is for my eigenvector. And so, again, my eigenvectors are in the vectors component. I saved the results actually in save.eig, which was different from what I had typed, save.it. And so I just need that for my x-axis coordinate, I need that first element. So I say 1, 1 row one, column one. For my y-axis coordinate, I need the two, one element. It's color red, line type solid. And if I do that, there you can see how I got that arrow. In the end, it's not too difficult once you know the code. Remember in this class, um, you can think of my uh, programs as templates for your own. So let's say if I wanted you, if I gave you another A matrix, and I said go ahead and draw the corresponding eigenvectors, what you would do is you get my program, make the changes to the A matrix, everything's pretty much going to run just fine, and you're going to get your plot. So think of my code as a template. In the meantime though, hopefully as you do this, then you'll start learning, oh yeah, of course, it's the arrows function that draws that out, or it's the plot function, or whatever. And so then you start learning so that maybe you don't necessarily need to always use my code as a template, because you've done this now a few times, you remember how to go ahead and do it again. Okay. Oops. Let's see here. Um, So I've already talked about this note. Note that other eigenvalues exist. So if I were to multiply these an eigenvector, eigenvector by negative 10, this gives me a new vector. But all it's doing is just extending out from the origin uh, what uh, that plot that that vector a little bit further. Uh, the length of it ends up being 10. Okay. Let's see here. I think, I think, uh, there was one last thing I wanted to do that I did originally skip over, and then when I was preparing for class yesterday, I realized, you know, I, sh I shouldn't have skipped it. And I want to talk about something really quick. This is on page 19. Something called linear dependence. And again, similar to many of these topics, depending upon your past experience coming in here, you may have seen this before or you may not. So we have this matrix A here. And uh, A is a square matrix, as we can see. 
If it's a square matrix, I could do a variety of different things with it, like you know, find eigenvalues. But also, maybe I can find the inverse of that matrix. Now, there are times where you actually cannot compute the inverse of a square matrix. And that is when you have what's called linear dependence. And all linear dependence means is as follows. Look at the second column here and compare it to the third column. Notice if I were to take three times that second column, I get the third column. When something like that happens, you have linear dependence. And when that happens, you actually cannot compute a regular old inverse of a matrix. Now, if you went to higher level matrix algebra classes, you'll learn that there are other kinds of inverses, such as what are called G inverses or C inverses, that allows you to do kind of the same thing. But at least for what we're doing here, you're not going to be able to calculate a regular old inverse. And that's going to pop up in your practice problems corresponding to this section of the notes. Now, there are other forms of linear dependence other than taking one vector times three to get the other, let's say, column or vector, you could say as well, uh, in that matrix. So, for example, maybe there's a situation where I could take, let's say, two times that, uh, that first column, I'll just call it V1, you know, minus, let's say, one times the second column, and maybe I'll get that third column. Okay? So, any combination of the columns, when you multiply them by constants and then add them or subtract them, if they lead to the, then another column, you have linear dependence. Now, if you don't have something like this, then you have what's called linear independence, and you can actually calculate the inverse. Okay. Let's move on here. Are there any questions? Okay, so now we're going to go to the, 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 uh, the last subsection of the intro to our course. Uh, the purpose here is to discuss what kind of data we're going to see. We've talked about that a little bit, but we're going to put some notation with it, so it's not necessarily the most interesting thing in the world. Uh, but this will help us introduce three data sets that we will be examining this semester in the context of our notation. Then we're going to talk about a very important probability distribution that uh, occurs in this course that probably most of you have not seen before. And then we're going to talk about correlation. Again, the name multivariate for a course, that name comes about, having, comes about uh, through saying that we're going to look at multiple variables at the same time. And so something that's going to be very important to us is understand how these variables are related to one another. You've learned in another course the concept of correlation that allows you to measure how variables are related to one another. So we'll review that concept, and then we'll put it into this multivariate context that we will uh, look at. Okay, so some very basics. In like a SAT 801 course, uh, you learn about something called an experimental unit. And all that means is basically, what is the object for which you are collecting data on? Um, and so, um, for example, with that high school and college GPA data set that we saw in the introduction to our notes, the experimental unit was a student. We were collecting information on their high school and college GPA. So they were experimental units. One could look at what's called um, univariate data, where you just have information measured on one variable, but then we are concerned about multivariate data where we have information measured on multiple variables, 2, 3, 10, 20, or more. And we're going to look at these relationships between the, these variables. So we're going to look at three data sets here that we're going to be examining during the semester. We'll be looking at other data sets as well, but these are th th the three that we probably will look at the most. And the first one deals with what I call the serial data. I know there's a few of you who have me for STAT 801 in the past. Uh, this is the exact same data that we looked at in that course. Uh, so um, uh, just uh, this will be re review. Um, 
in terms of this introduction to the data, uh, but uh, that that's okay. Uh, so you already know what the motivation would be behind it. <clears throat> okay, so this is a this is taken this picture is taken from a local grocery store. Grocery stores more, uh, often range the same way, where you have what if we, what you would call dry cereals arranged down an aisle of a grocery store, maybe just on let's say just one side of the aisle. And we have, in this case, five different shelves of cereal, dry cereal. And, you know, when, when you look at this aisle, or at least I'm a statistician, so I look at the aisle maybe different from how you look at the aisle, you know, it makes me wonder, why are certain types of cereals on particular shelves? You know, why is Kellogg's All brand here? on the top shelf, let's call it shelf five, and why is Kellogg's Frosted Flakes on the bottom shelf? Is it because they're great? <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. Um, or is it for some other reason? And so, um, I once decided to go and collect some data so I could better understand these cereals relative to their shelf placement and the various, let's say, nutritional aspects to them. So I went to a particular uh, grocery store. It wasn't this particular one where I have this picture. And I collected what's called a stratified random sample, meaning that I looked at sh shelf one, that bottom shelf, and I randomly selected 10 cereals. And I collected information about the sugar content, the fat content, and also the sodium content. And then I went to the next shelf, randomly selected 10 cereals, did the same thing. Now to help motivate, well, why maybe certain types of cereals, maybe let's say those that have a high sugar content might be on particular shelves, or those with a high fat content might be on particular shelves, I also shot a short video. So this is a video I shot a few years ago. My wife is actually doing the video. I'm obviously in the picture too. Uh, and this is uh, uh, my son, Callum, when he was much younger. And we're actually on the other side, same grocery store as what's in the picture, on the other side of the, of the aisle. It just so happens they have to have, have, they like to put toys on the other side. And so once I get these toys out of his hands. He was really into Thomas the Tank Engine at this time. I say, Cal, go over here, just pick out any cereal you want and put it into our cart. And so he's looking, he's looking, and he finds Cocoa Crisp, a cereal that's marketed to children that's very high in sugar content. And I say, Cal, go get another one. Oh, he picks out. Cocoa Puffs, high, oh, and he wants more Cocoa Puffs. High sugar content cereals that are marketed towards children. Now, you know, notice how, how, what his height was relative to these uh, shelves. He could only grab stuff from shelf one, stuff from shelf two, basically. And so where my, high, let's say my research hypothesis is, where are these grocery stores going to put these cereals that are marketed towards kids? Well, they're going to put them on shelf one. They're going to put them on shelf two because the kids can easily grab them and put it into their parents' cart. Now, how do we you know, say, well, what's a cereal that's marketed towards children? And this is where I thought, okay, Cereals that are marketed towards children, unfortunately, often are the ones that have the high sugar content. So could we use then statistics to actually show that indeed these high sugar content cereals are on the bottom shelves? Then also, could we maybe explore some other stuff? Could we find maybe the high sodium content ones were on, let's say, shelf five? Or maybe the high fat ones are on shelf three, typically. And so that's some stuff that we're going to be looking at with this particular data set. 
So this is the actual data set. Um, it is on my website, serial.csv, so it would be my data distributions um, and correlation section. So the very first serial that I sampled, so this is my first experimental unit, was Kellogg's Razzle Dazzle Rice Krispies. It had a serving size of 28 grams, 10 grams of sugar, zero fat, 170 milligrams of sodium. The second experimental unit was post Tosis cornflakes, and, and you can keep on coming down here. Now, one thing that's of note, notice how these serving sizes are not necessarily the same. So if I wanted to compare, let's say, one, uh, if I want to compare the cereals on shelf one to shelf two, I'm going to need to take into account that some might have higher sugar content simply because they have a higher serving size. So we're going to see some adjustments to this data that I'm going to make later. Now, an assumption that we often have to make for methods in this course is that the experimental units are independent of one another. Do you think these experimental units are independent? Now, all of you have seen independence before, in set 801 or the equivalent. Do you think the experimental units are independent? Got one yes. We have other people that are not as sure. And they're afraid to shake their head one way or the other. So I think it's questionable. The reason being is because notice how you know, we have Kellogg's here, we have Kellogg's there. So the same manufacturer, so maybe there's a little bit of dependence in my data simply due to uh, the fact that the same, manu same manufacturer might be uh, manufacturing multiple series. And so this then comes down to a practical question that one, is often, that one often faces. It's not too important right now, but as it go, we go along, it can be. And that is, is it independent enough that we can go ahead and use our statistical methods? In the end, I think it, I think it, it is, uh, but it's still, it's, a, it's questionable. And so let's say, you know, you know, all of you are you know, grad school, I think most of you are your PhD students, and you know, you're going to be doing some kind of research, and hopefully you want to publish that research, and you're going to have to write a paper. And so in the paper, you, you're going to need to say, if I'm applying, let's say, some method from SET873, you know, you know, I have to assume independence. It is somewhat questionable because of these reasons, but in the end, I don't think it's going to really affect my analysis in terms of the information I get out of it. So those are important things to think about in the grand scheme of things. Okay, so here's a, a, another data set. This is called goblet data. Uh, well, I, uh, the, the data is located a little bit later in my notes. Um, and, and so this is actually just from an exercise in a book that I, I once found. And imagine a situation where you're at an archaeology site and you're coming across these goblets that you're digging out of the ground. And, you know, to help make sense of the different shapes of these goblets, you might want to have some way that you could organize them in some way based upon similar qualities to the goblets. So, for example, here's a little bit of a diagram that actually I got out of the book. You know, maybe. You know, goblets that have, let's say, a big opening at the top. You want to put all those into a grouping. Or maybe goblets that tend to have, let's say, a big overall base, which could be based upon, you know, this is meant to mean X1 is measuring the width of the top. X5 is maybe measuring the width of the bottom in some respect in terms of where it's hitting the, the, the base. So it's multiple variables that correspond to the base, uh, correspond to the top, the, the cup portion of the goblet. That's what I meant to say. Maybe you want to organize these goblets in a way that ones that have a big cup part should all be in one grouping versus ones that have a small cup. And so, how can you do that? You know, maybe there might be some goblets that are, let's say, huge in overall size and that cup is big relative to the overall size, and then others that are small in overall size, 
where the cup is also big relative to that size. I mean, but you would want them to group those together because they have the same cup qualities to them. And so what we're going to do is look at ways that we can organize these goblets. It's a small data set, so that's why it's often nice to use in a class setting such as this, because we can look at stuff visually, too, more easily than if it was a very large data set. And so the first experimental unit had 13 centimeters as the width of the, the opening of the top of the cup part. And you can look at some of these other measurements on your own corresponding to uh, uh, these goblet measurements. And then the last data set that we're going to be looking at, at least here today, is what I call the place game data set. This is a data set that I actually collected as well. And so what I did was I went through the historical records of one um, season of the National Football League. Every time there was a place kick attempted, I collected information on it. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if everyone knows what I mean by a place kick in football, but just in case not. I have a short video here. Oh, where did that video go? Let's see here. As you can see, I like to have lots of videos for teaching purposes. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, because when I went through this uh, yesterday, I had the video with me. Okay, there it is. Okay. So, in football, there are two different kinds of place kicks. There's what's called a field goal, and this is what we're going to be looking at here which is worth three points to the kicking team if successful. What do I mean by that? Well, this is called, where you see my mouse, this is called the place kicker. And he's going to kick a ball from about this spot here. And his goal is to get it between the two uprights. And also, you can't see in this picture here, but there's also what's called a crossbar that's 10 feet above the ground. So he needs to get it within this goal area for his team to score three points. Uh, if he does, we'll call it a success. If he, if he doesn't, we'll call it a failure. And in this particular case, um, it's a very critical part of the game. And it's hard to see here because I, I haven't paused. But his team, which is Baltimore, has 16 points. And the team he's playing is Detroit, has 17 points. So if he's successful on this kick, Baltimore will now have 19 points. And they will be winning the game. And in fact, there's only three seconds left to go in the game. And so they will actually win the game if he's successful. But what makes this place kick difficult is the kick is from 66 yards. And if you're a football fan, you know that's a long place kick, long field goal attempt. And so you might think, OK, well, you know, what's going to affect his probability of success? Or you know, is it going to be a success or failure? Probably that distance is going to be very important. But also, there's a lot of pressure on him, too, because if he misses it, he knows he's, he's lost the game for his team. So there's a pressure effect, too. And so you might be some, wondering somehow, can I measure the distance? Can I measure the pressure? Can I look at the fact that this actual kick is actually done indoors versus outdoors? So you can think that probably wind's not going to have much of a factor. You know, if it was windy, that would affect his ability to make it or miss it, or success or failure. It's going to be attempted off of artificial turf here rather than grass. So you might think maybe that might have an effect. And so you can measure all these variables and thus have a multivariate data set and look at, let's say, for all place kickers in total, what factors affect a success or failure? And can I come up with a model that will help me predict that? And so that's something that we're going to be doing in this class. So let's look at what happens here. Uh, this is. Uh, the place kicker's name is Justin Tucker. Unfortunately, I don't have a way to connect this computer to the sound system here. And so you miss, you miss what, what has happened, actually. So the kick is actually good. He actually hit the ball off that 
10 foot high crossbar and it bounced and went through the goal. And you can see uh, the fans were, or the players were very happy about it. And this is a nice little angle. It bounces and then goes through. I think this might be the record for the longest place kick ever made in the NFL. And by the way, Justin Tucker might be the greatest kicker ever in the NFL. Of course, I'm not going to show you a kick that was missed. <laughs> um, so, so I collected data on place kicks, field goals, which are worth, again, three points to the kicking team if successful, and also point after touchdowns, or PAT, which are worth one point to the kicking team if successful. These PATs, as you might expect from the name, are done after a touchdown has been scored. That's the only time they're ever done. So here's the information I collected. The week of the season, you know, maybe a, foot, <laughs> a place kicker's foot gets tired by the end of the season, and that might affect his ability to make or miss the kick. Who knows? Well, I can collect that information, so let's go ahead and do it. The distance of the place kick. Change is going to help me measure pressure. Where change is a binary variable where it's going to be equal to a 1 if it causes a lead change in the game. So the kick that we just saw would have change equal 1. If instead the score was, let's say, um, the kicking team had 0 points and the other team had 16 points, well, a successful kick makes it 3 to 16. So that would not be a lead change place kick. And so I would say change is equal to 0. It's hard to measure pressure. I don't have a way to say, hey, Justin Tucker, do you feel pressure or not? Uh, so I had to use a, um, um, a, a, a kind of a variable in place of what, what pressure is. Another possible variable that measures pressure is the lap 30, which measures the time remaining in a half of a football game. So as you get down towards the end of the half of the football game, you might think that there's more pressure. PAT tells me if it's a point after touchdown or field goal. Type tells me if it's, in a, if it's indoors or outdoors. Field is, uh, tells me if it's grass or artificial turf in terms of the kicking surface. And wind is a variable which helps me measure is it windy or not. It's actually going to be a binary variable. Now you might be wondering, well, why don't you just use like wind speed and maybe wind direction? The problem with that is that actually inside of you know, dome stadiums, or when the roof is closed on a stadium, there's still wind circulation because of the air handling system. And some stadiums will give me that information, but others do not. You know, if you're a baseball fan, you know, for example, when the Minnesota Twins, when they used to play in, in their dome stadium, there was always a kind of a legend that, uh, that when the opposing team was up to bat, they would turn up the air conditioner system really high to blow, keep the ball inside, um, um, uh, to, keep, to prevent the ball from being a home run. So I, I had problems with how to take into account wind. So I just decided and decide to say windy versus non-windy. Also, uh, wind tends to swirl in stadiums. So, you know, I had information. Well, the wind's uh, east, from uh, out of the east at 15 miles per hour. But what's it actually like right inside the, the stadium and the particular part of the stadium where the kick is done? So, for example, if you follow the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know the wind swirls in their stadium. So here's my data then. So the first experimental unit, it was week one of the season, was a 21-yard kick. Uh, change was equal to one. There was a lot of time left in the half. PAT is equal to zero, meaning it was a field goal. Uh, type equal one, meaning it is an uh, outdoor stadium. Field equal one, meaning it was off of grass. It was not windy. And then my main variable, you can say of interest, that tells me, is it a success or failure, is called good. Was it good or not? Was it a success or not? Good equal one means yes, it was a success. It was a make. Zero was a failure. Okay. So what I'd like to do then is use these variables then to help me predict a success or a failure for a field goal. Okay. So those are the main data sets. Now, as what you've seen in these data that I've shown you is that we have, you can say, two different kinds of variables. Continuous variables and also discrete variables. 
variables. Uh, I would imagine these terms are not, are not unfamiliar. So we can think of, let's say, elap 30 as a continuous variable. Because that could be anywhere between, let's say, 0 and 30 minutes. 30 minute uh, football plays 30 minute halves. Now you might be wondering, well, wait a second, but you know, we all, you're only measuring in terms of like seconds. Like uh, there might be, um, let's say, 20 minutes and 10 seconds left to go in the half. Well, yes, in the end, there are a finite number of possibilities, but there's, not, there's still a lot of possibilities. So because of that, we're going to think of this as a con what's called a continuous variable. Now, other cases, we have what are called discrete variables. So for example, wind for us is going to be a discrete variable. It has two possibilities, a zero or a one. Now, the reason why it's important to differentiate between discrete and continuous variables is because, um, as you've seen in probably other courses, we have to make certain mathematical assumptions with the statistical methods that we use. Very often, we're going to have to make the assumption that we have a continuous variable. So then you might be worried, OK, is this statistical method going to work as advertised if I don't have these assumptions satisfied? So we'll talk about that as we go along. So I've actually, the first day, I kind of already went over some of this. You know, some of the topics that we're going to uh, talk about this semester really briefly. So one of the first things that we're going to do next after this section, subsection, is to talk about graphics. We're going to look at, um, you know, how can we uh, look at our data visually? Uh, you know, if you've heard of the, uh, uh, the, the phrase, it's something like a, a picture is like a thousand words or something like that, meaning that there's so much meaning in, in visualizing something. Well, graphs do the same thing in terms of looking at data. So we'll start with simple scatter plots, and then we'll expand to other kinds of kinds of plots to take into account that we have multivariate data. We'll look at principal component analysis and factor analysis, which allows us to try to simplify having so many variables and basically condense them in a way so that we only have a few variables without losing information. Cluster analysis helps us to examine then how we can group previously ungrouped items. So for example, we're going to use this with the goblet data. We're going to try to find similar goblets using cluster analysis. And then corresponding to that last data, that place kicking data set, we're going to look at methods to predict. Um, in this case, a success or failure. And there's many different methods out there. Um, and I said, I think the first day, for this part of the course, there could be a whole course on it. So we're not going to be able to talk about everything. For this part of the course, there could be a whole course on it as well. OK, so let's now start talking about some notation. I'll define the notation, then I'll put in the context of, of, of some of our data that we just saw. Uh, we'll try to be consistent across the variety of different topics in terms of our notation. We're always going to let P be the number of variables that we have. Capital N is going to be the number of experimental units, or to put it simply, our sample size, capital N. We're going to let X sub RJ, little x sub RJ, be the value of the jth variable on the rth experimental unit. Capital X is going to contain all of our data. It's going to be a matrix matrix of these little x of rj's, you could say. It's going to have a dimension of n minus p, I'm sorry, n by p. n rows corresponds to the number of observations that we have. p columns corresponds to our variables. So each column is going to correspond to a particular variable of interest. At times, we might just want to look at, let's say, one observation that we have, one experimental unit that we have, and so we can form a vector called x sub r for the rth experimental unit and put in all its corresponding data values into that vector. If you want, you could actually transpose it. So instead of having a row vector, you have a column. Instead of having a column vector, you have a row vector. And essentially, then our x matrix then is all these vectors corresponding to every single observation. 
So in the context then of the serial data, let's look at that. Uh, before we do that, we need to think about how we, uh, we're gonna need to take into account that serving size again. Um, you know, the serials have different serving sizes. And so when I compare one serial to the next, I need to take that into account. A simple way to do that is to take always each of its measurements, like in sugar, fat, and sodium, and simply divide by the serving size. That's it. And so that's how I'm going to adjust the data. You'll see how I do that later in the notes um, in R, but we're going to have this adjusted data. And so in the end, this is what our data set that we're actually going to analyze is going to look, look like. So in this particular case, we're going to be concerned with these four variables. You can think of serial here as just kind of more of a label. Um, I suppose you don't need ID, but I, I have it there as well. And so in this case, we're going to have four variables. We have 40 observations because we have a stratified random sample where we sample 10 items from each shelf. In our terms of our notation, X of RJ, RF experimental unit. Uh, that must be really cool out there. We have the J variable. So that means X sub 1, 1, first experimental unit, first variable, is this right here. X sub 1, 2, first experimental unit, second variable, 0 0.3571. I can then organize all this into a nice matrix form. Okay? So it's not difficult at all. Okay, so let's, let's start talking about some stuff that, um, uh, let's talk about the, the probability distribution part of this um, subsection of notes. What's called the multivariate normal distribution. All of you have seen a univariate normal distribution before. Uh, meaning, um, you know, you would say, let's say X has a normal distribution with a particular mean and a particular variance. So, how about we let x be a random variable with a univariate normal distribution. Its expected value is mu. Its variance is sigma squared. And I just remember how do we find a variance? Well, it's actually, I look at my x, subtract off the mean, so I look at their distance. I square it so that I always have a positive distance, essentially. And then by using the expected value there, it says, what on average is that square distance from you. So it tells me how far is my x from you on average, essentially. And we often use the Greek letter sigma to represent, I'm um, sorry, sigma squared then to represent the variance. Sigma would be the standard deviation. Now, people often represent this symbolically like this. x tilde does anyone know what the tilde stands for? What, what words? Something I don't teach in 801, typically, set 801 typically. But it is common, um, common syn uh, syntax terminology. Not approximate. Distributed as. I don't talk, I don't say it in study on one typically because there's so many different terms out there. I don't need to introduce another one, but this is very common how people write stuff out once you get beyond study on one. Is the tilde there means distributed as. So X is distributed as the capital N in this context represents a normal distribution. X is distributed as a normal random variable with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared. So again, X is distributed as a normal random variable with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared. Common phrasing that people use in statistics, common notation. And so all this means then is that we have this as my probability density function for the normal. All of you should have seen this before. Just maybe it's written slightly different from what you've seen before. So 
I have f, I have a function of x, my random variable. The vertical line that you may not have seen where it refers to as given, the word given, you've seen conditional probabilities before where you had a vertical line phrased as given. So I say f of x given values for my mu and sigma because that's essentially going to control the shape of my normal distribution. It's going to control how this function is evaluated. I need to know what those values are. Is equal to, then you're just your regular old normal distribution expression. Of course, for a normal random variable, you don't have any bounds on it. It's between negative infinity and positive infinity. So if I were to actually plot the normal distribution, if I knew what mu was, if I knew what sigma squared was, I would get a bunch of different values of x, plug it into this equation, and I would do a plot, and it's going to look something like this, that regular old bell curve that's centered at mu. What controls how far the, the sides of that distribution come out is sigma. What's the area underneath this curve? It well, the area underneath represents probability. Underneath the whole curve is the area is 1. So you could actually if you have a calculus background, I think most of you do, you could actually do some integration, find this area, and it will be one. Well, how can I actually plot this in R? This will help motivate them once we do what's called a multivariate normal distribution. So I have this program called normalplot.r that you can download from my website that shows how to do the plot. So let's say that x is distributed as a normal random variable with a mean of 50 and a variance of 9. So 3 squared. So the standard deviation is 3. So how could I plot this f of x given mu and sigma? Let me come over here. Okay. First, I need to know, well, how could I get, how could I evaluate that f of x? Well, I could program in f of x myself. That would be a waste of time because there is actually a function r called d, uh, d D norm that does the actual f of x calculation for you. So all I need to do is say D norm, <coughs> excuse me, x equal 40, if I want to evaluate it at 40, put in my mean, put in my standard deviation or sigma itself, SD stands for standard deviation, and my f of x is going to be 0 0.005, 0 0.0005. And so on my plot, I find where 40 is. I go up where 0.0005 is, and I put like a point. I could do that for other values of x as well. You know, maybe perhaps I want to do it for a lot of different values. And because of how r operates, I can put a whole vector of values in there and get each of the values out automatically. Okay. Now, to do then a plot of all, add a whole bunch of different values of x, we can use a function called curve. And so this is how curve works. And this was actually in the introduction to R notes too. I have an expression. I have my f of x, you can say. And I say what my f of x is. D norm, x is equal to, well, what I want to evaluate this function at. And I have to use the letter x here because this is going on my x-axis. So R is actually looking for something in this expression that says x. You might be thinking, well, you have an x there. Well, no, that's my argument name. I need an x here. Put my mean of 50, standard deviation of 3. Now, my x-axis limits I'm going to set to be between 40 and 60. And so when r runs this function, what's going to happen is r is going to automatically put in 101 values evenly spaced between 40 and 60 into this d norm. And then essentially it's going to then from that construct the corresponding plot. The line on the plot is going to be red, x-axis label f, I'm sorry, x, y-axis label f of x, and a nice title to the plot. Here we go. Um, let me show you. And there's my normal distribution. So again, 101 values, that's the default, you can change it to something else that are going to be found for, for the x's 
They find the corresponding value of f of x, and then simply it's plotted from that. Now I'm going to add a horizontal line at zero so that we can better see that bottom portion of the plot. The area underneath that curve is one. So that's how the curve function works. Um, I have a little other example here. If you want to, let's say, graph f of x is equal to x squared, um, you can see that as well. Okay. Now, let me come back over here. So that's for that's a univariate normal distribution. I have one variable. Let's let's say I have two variables, three variables, four variables. And let's say jointly together they have a normal distribution. We would call that a multivariate normal distribution. So in the end, instead of having a random variable x, I have a random vector called x. And in, in general, it could be a p by 1 vector. Now to help understand this multivariate normal distribution, we need to define some quantities with this with this with these x's. First of all, each of the x's is going to have a mean mu. These means could be different, so we're going to call it mu sub i. So the i x has a mean of mu sub i. We also need to understand the relationships between these x's. What's the relationship between x1 and x2 defined in a uh, mathematical context? And the way that we do that is something that I, um, I used this terminology a little bit last time, is that we can define what's called a covariance. All that a covariance is, is another type of expected value. You've seen expected values for just the random variable itself. That's what this is. You've seen expected values, well, here. You've seen expected values in terms of variances. Define a variance. All that a covariance is, is a type of expected value. Symbolically, if we had, if we want the, let's say, the, uh, the covariance between xi and xj, so two variables, I'm just trying to be general here without saying i is 1 or j is 2. I have the covariance of xi and xj, just um, notation, and it's the expected value of how far is x of i from its corresponding mean times how far x of j is from its corresponding mean. <coughs> Since I have an expected value there, that means on average, how far are they from their mean multiplied together? Well, why are we multiplying it together? Think of it this way. Suppose x of i and x of j well, let me put it this way. So when x of i, let's say, is above its mean, x of j is usually above its mean as well. When x of i is below its mean, x of j is typically below its mean as well. Think of like how observed values, you're taking a sample. So in other words, they, send, they tend to have, and I'm going to uh, use this phrase, because I think you understand what I mean. They tend to have positive dependence, meaning when x is high, I'm sorry, when xi is high, xj is going to be high. When xi is low, xj is going to be low. What this, is, what this is going to do then for us is say, what do I expect on average? This relationship then, since I'm multiplying these two guys together, what, what's going to happen here in terms of this deviation? So notice if I have this positive dependence that I just talked to you about, this covariance is going to be positive. If we think of it from a different point of view, let's say when x sub i is high, x of j is low, and vice versa, look what's going to happen. On average, then this multiplying these two deviations from their means, on average, that's going to be negative. So I'm going to have negative dependence. And so what a covariance measures is, on average, what kind of relationship you have between x i and xj. Again, more symbols here. People often refer to this also as sigma sub ij. Now you might be wondering, wait a second, we just use sigma to represent variances. Well, there's a good reason why. 
Because notice if I were to have the expected value of xi minus mu sub i times, how about I just put xi minus mu sub i again? So notice this would be like the covariance of xi and xi. That's just my variance. So now you can see variance in a little bit of a different point of view than perhaps what you've seen before. It's a special case of a covariance. That's, that's why they have names that are very similar to one another. It's a special form of a covariance. And notice we're going to use sigma sub ii to now represent our variance. Now let's put this also in a context of stuff that you have seen before. All of you, in a steady to one like course, you've talked about correlation, correlation coefficient. You might have only talked about it in terms of calculating on a sample though before. But we can think about correlation coefficient as well in terms of population quantities. You know, this is a population quantity, this is a population quantity, this is a population quantity. We can think of correlation in terms of a population quantity. So if I want to know the correlation between xi and xj, all it is is that covariance between xi and xj divided by the square root of the variance of xi times the variance of xj. Now remember what correlation measures. It measures dependence. And you know, in terms of what you've seen before in terms of a sample, you know that a correlation coefficient is always between negative one and positive one. The same thing here occurs too in terms of this population quantity. And so typically we prefer to work with a correlation coefficient rather than a covariance because notice I did not put any kind of bounds between that covariance. It can actually be between negative infinity and positive infinity. And so it's hard to make the judgment of well, do I have strong positive dependence or do I have weak positive dependence? Do I have strong negative dependence or do I have weak negative dependence? I know if I have positive or negative dependence, yes, but I don't know the strength. And so when we do this little transformation then with this covariance, basically we're taking into account the amount of variability that we have. I get a value that's always between negative one and one. And so when I'm very close to one, I know I have strong positive dependence. When I'm very close to zero, but on the positive side, I have weak positive dependence. People will often use the Greek letter rho, R-H-O, to represent the correlation coefficient in terms of a population context. Some people will also use the word core, C-O-R-R, parentheses X-I, X-J, to represent the same thing. I, show you this because it, it's common. It's good to know in case you're looking at something outside of this class. Now, we can put all these means into a vector. So I could have a vector. Notice how that is a bolded mu there to represent mu1 through mu p. Also, I can put all those covariances that we just saw into a matrix. There's my matrix there. We're going to call that matrix sigma. That is a bolded symbol there. And so we could also write this as the cove of my vector x. And in fact, this expected value then extends to working with the vector x minus mu times x minus mu transpose. Take the expected value of that. You can multiply out all these values, and you're going to see then, well, this is what I had written previously to be at covariance of xi and xj. Oh, I'm sorry, one, covariance of x1 and x2, and so on. I know we're running out of time. One thing I want to make sure that I mention in case I forget to uh, mention this next time, note that it doesn't matter the order of xi and xj in here. So I could have um, the covariance of xi and xj also is the expected value of xj minus mu j, sorry, 
times xi minus mu i as well. The ordering doesn't matter. They will actually be, if you do the calculation, they will be the same, which will then lead to a symmetric matrix. Okay, so we're out of time here. Sorry about that. Uh, so what's next in our course? So I'll have office hours right after class. I will only be here for the office hours. The reason being is because I need to get to uh, city campus for a meeting, and, and because of my condition with my with my leg, it doesn't make sense for me to go sit in my office for you know like a half hour or whatever. You know, go all the way over to my office, go all the way up. It's a long walk, <laughs> and then to go all the way back down a half hour later, so I get to my meeting. So I'm here. I can I can talk to you here as needed. Tuesday we'll continue with the with the distribution part of this uh, subsection of notes. Wednesday of next week, you will have a quiz that's due. It's over the matrix algebra stuff. And then looking farther ahead, be, take note of this. You will also have a quiz for week four, but will be on a, due on a different date. The reason being is because I want to have an opportunity to, to address any problems that might have come up in the Tuesday class, September 12th, because on Thursday, September 14th, we have a test over the R, intro to R, matrix algebra, and this data distributions and correlation stuff. Okay? Are there any questions before we end class? Okay, that's all for today then.